Good morning. Welcome everyone to day two of the MAS Summit for New York City. And we are so glad so many of you are back again and welcome to our new participants for joining us today. And of course to our fantastic online audience who yesterday logged in from over 27 cities from around the country and around the world. I heard we were a big hit in Albania. The true, right? I mean, yeah. Um, and also, uh, if, if you're out in the adjacent areas of jazz, you can hear me. And um, this event this morning is oversubscribed. Uh, there are a few seats back. So if you are out there, folks, I encourage you to come in as quickly as possible and take these seats, uh, or you will be standing in the back. And we had plenty of people standing in the back yesterday, too, which was very thrilling to see. Um, and also, again, welcome to our uh, growing online audience. We are live streamed. Um, if you are on your devices, please tell your friends. They can just simply go to mas.org uh, to watch this summit. I was getting messages all day yesterday from folks watching from their homes and offices. And, um, and this summit uh, continues to grow through the year uh, as the content uh, gets uh, just uh, downloaded like crazy, um, thousands of times, all over, uh, for months, uh, as people look to the conversations of this terrific meeting uh, to help them shape their thinking about their cities. Today, our focus moves to leadership, ways we as New Yorkers must step forward to make our city both more livable and certainly more resilient. As you saw in that short clip, New York City is not the only global city to become home to both the large challenges and innovative solutions that resilience and livability present. Last fall, we were fortunate to host a global convening at the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Conference Center, together with two dozen other city practitioners drawn from 15 cities around the world we began a discussion about how to create a learning network that connects people around the world who are doing innovative, practical things locally to boost the livability and resilience of their neighborhoods and cities. What can New Yorkers learn from and contribute to others working on similar challenges in Nairobi, Bandung, Mumbai, London? MAS has worked for over a century tackling challenges that face the city in real time, current, pressing, challenges, preserving neighborhoods, cultivating the arts as effective use of public space, of supporting policies and investments that serve all of New Yorkers equitably and strengthen neighborhoods on their distinctiveness while continuing to build places that enable ingenuity, spark innovation, and create connections that make the city dynamic and vital, a culturally and economically diverse mix that is so, so New York. Our experience has taught us a lot about how to make this city livable, from the hyper-local to the supra-macro. We've done both and we continue to learn what, which approach is right and when. And then, last fall, we joined an increasingly less rare group of world cities, challenged by a severe weather event that left thousands homeless and many more in the dark as our coasts and parks and canals and streets rollicked in the rain and storm surge and power outages that affected us in the tri-state region that surrounds us. Welcome to the new normal. In cities around the world, organizations like MAS must advocate for initiatives and investments that build the resilience and livability of our cities simultaneously. These can no longer be traded off. Sustainable city building has got to be both and. Livability and resilience go hand in hand, and civil society has a crucial leadership role in forging these linkages and helping identify effective, granular interventions to see how they can be scaled up and strengthened. In fact, in the MAS survey on livability in New York City, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, Results are uh, online uh, as of yesterday morning. Uh, New Yorkers placed resilience planning, preparedness, right up at the top of the list of priorities for the new administration, along with jobs and affordability. New Yorkers know city building is an art. 
pursued with great vigor and enthusiasm, not only here, but almost on every continent. One of our great partners on this continent is Stephen Huddard, the president of the J.W. McConnell Foundation, one of Canada's most prominent charitable foundations based in Montreal. Would you please welcome me, will help me welcome Stephen Huddard. Stephen. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Vin. Um, good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Buenos dias a todos. Um, you know, in a past life, I uh, owned and ran a jazz cafe in Vancouver and uh, welcomed many players from uh, this great city. And uh, to imagine that one day I'd be standing at Jazz at Lincoln Center speaking to people is uh, quite remarkable. Uh, and, and I reflected that jazz is a great metaphor for the work that we're called to do. The innovation, the collaboration uh, is really, uh, I think, a, a, a tremendous form that we're, we're creating here together and, and jazz is a great way of describing that. Uh, Vin, working with you and, and Mary Rowe and, and the MAS team uh, and just being at this conference is a little bit like the experience of watching that line at the bottom of the screen when you're downloading a TED Talk. Ted talk. You know, you know there's something coming, that it's being prepared for you, that when it arrives, you know it'll speak to you just where you are and that you're just waiting to hear that. And that's been my experience of being at this conference, I'm sure for many of you as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to today and, and wishing you a great experience as well. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and to, to see up close where New York is heading uh, because it's so important to where we are in Canada. This is a photograph taken of downtown Calgary on June 21st. After the worst floods in Alberta uh, basically shut down the city, it took five days to restore power to the downtown core. 350,000 people couldn't go to work. 100,000 had to be relocated. And while not on Sandy's scale, the parallels are clear. A need for rapid response and for a radical rethinking about how we design cities for the long term. Now, Calgary amazed the rest of Canada with how quickly it got back on its feet. What made the difference was an inspiring mayor, dedicated civic officials, and a civic culture based on prairie barn raising, around looking after your neighbors when they're in need. There were people working 20 hours a day volunteering when they didn't have an, their own home to go back to, helping others. People on the streets helping the, the sanitation people load what was being taken out of basements, uh, wet plaster and so on, uh, loading those trucks so that they could get through the neighborhoods faster. Thousands and thousands of people volunteering. Uh, it was quite an inspiring thing to see. So there, and here in New York, we got the short term right. And now it's time for the long term, and that's much less certain. As cities, companies, community organizations, we're on new ground, needing to become resilient in the face of massive shifts be they climactic, economic, or demographic, or the unexpected. In a real sense, we have to innovate around how we innovate, and that's why we're here. As a philanthropic foundation based in Canada, we have come to appreciate that to successfully address our challenges, we need to array ourselves around them in new collaborative relationships, one of which is peer-to-peer -peer networks. There are four reasons why this is important. First, they allow rapid sharing of ideas and other resources in an open and accessible manner. This is not a high-cost, high-entry uh, pro 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 proposition. This is accessible widely at very low cost. Second, these networks allow for broad iteration of learning and implementation strategies. We have to get this right. We need to do it quickly. We need to do it with awareness of what others are doing so that we don't make the same mistakes as they are. And so we can learn together, manage diversity to, to good effect. They also provide the means by which thought and practice leaders, funders, investors, and others can find one another. As Lisa Gansky says, serendipity accelerates innovation. Finally, they allow for multi-sectoral contribution and collaboration in making change happen. We're now at a point where governments can't do it alone, civil society can't do it alone, and certainly foundations and, uh, can't, do the, can't do this alone. Corporations, we all need to be together working on these things. So I wanna share three examples briefly of this kind of approach that we're involved in. This is the, uh, 
a, a, slide, a screenshot from the beta version of a program called InnoWeave, a platform for organizing and delivering high quality management support at low cost to change leaders everywhere. It offers a tangible means of um, corporations to contribute some of those shared values we've been hearing so much about, and a cost-effective tool for governments to invest in community resilience. It also organizes a marketplace for consultants and coaches. At one level, it's a website. At another, it's a, a webinar you can take. At another, it's a workshop you can participate in. And if, if you've gone through all of that and you want to work on implementing a new a tool or approach in your organization, there's a grant fund that allows you to hire a consultant or a coach to help you through the implementation phase. Let's take it another one. This is the SVX, uh, supported uh, with, uh, created with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, a social stock exchange that we launched in Toronto in partnership with the Toronto Stock Exchange that runs on their platform, um, a way of raising capital for uh, promising new startups that are offering a blended social, environmental, and financial return to investors. It's a regional model, and it's ready to scale across Canada and the United States. If we had more time today, I would talk to you about the Quebec social economy, where 10% of GDP is organized around these kinds of enterprises, cooperatives, uh, large-scale uh, networks, and so on, around engaging people in the economic future of their communities. Finally, here is a schematic for Cities for People, our new partnership with MAS. So in this diagram, the outer circle represents civic culture, our beliefs, behaviors, the institutional norms that can sometimes hold us in counterproductive patterns. And the way to influence that is through the innovations we can generate in the sharing economy, around governance and civic engagement, the built and natural environment, and social purpose arts. It says social inclusion up there, but we're talking about social purpose arts. So we're in the process of appointing curators in each of those domains, whose job it will be to make connections, surface and share new learning, and organize site visits, paid internships, and exchanges within and among cities uh, and across regions. With MAS, we look forward to connecting these in Canada to a corollary, corollary network in this country, and eventually to a network of grassroots and large-scale innovators around the world. So let me conclude with an invitation to all of you to join us in this conversation. This is a, a photograph uh, of a, a a gathering that we organized with MAS and a couple of other foundations last summer, looking at the question of the role that arts and culture play in this broader process, this broader uh, shift towards a more resilient culture. So 40 people came together from around the world and worked on a paper that I'd love you to take a look at called The Art of Resilience, The Resilience of Art. You can Google that and download it. Uh, it's intended to spark the civic imagination. It's a philanthropic contribution to this work that you are all involved in, and we so very much look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you so much. Great.